Hey class, we're going to go over the rules of implication before we get into the proofs, okay? But this video will really help prepare you for the proofs. And remember when we started logic, I told you that when I hear an argument like um, if she's singing and she's happy, she's happy, therefore she's singing, I don't even think about the singing and happiness and stuff. I just think of if P then Q, Q therefore P, and I know that argument is bad, fallacious, and valid. Okay. It's called affirming the consequent fallacy. And people who study logic, that's one of the benefits of studying this type of logic, is you can quickly see these valid and invalid forms. So on this page, we have the rules of implication that we'll be using in the proofs. The first one, and by the way, the rules of implication mean that all of these arguments are valid. They're all good. And I'll show you some invalid ones later that you want to avoid. Okay, so the first one is called modus ponens. And this is when we argue if P, then Q. P, therefore Q. So how can you remember this? How can you know this is true? The first thing I recommend is putting in content, substitution ex um, instances. So for example, let's say P is singing in the rain, okay, and Q is happy. So if I'm singing in the rain, then I'm happy. The second premise says I'm singing in the rain, and therefore we can conclude that I'm happy. Sometimes you'll see, too, when we do this, there's three little dots, and that means therefore or it might be under the line like that. Okay, So substitute in instances and you'll always find that it's valid. Even if I said uh, for P, if I eat the frog then I'll turn into Snow White. I ate the frog therefore I'm Snow White. That's a valid argument. And now of course the premise is false so it's unsound but it's still valid and, and the reason is, is you have to remember what the definition of valid is. Valid is the form of the argument. It's uh, when it's impossible for the conclusion to be false if we assume the premises are true. Okay, So modus ponens is valid, but if you still want to check it even further, you can do a truth table. Okay, So on this screen, you can see a truth table. Um, you can make sure these rules are valid by talking them out. This is called the counterexample method, or by making truth tables. So you can see my truth table. Um, I have the two premises and the conclusion all diagrammed. and modus ponens over here. So there is no line where you have two true premises and a false conclusion. Therefore, this argument, modus ponens, is valid. Okay? So talk it out over and over. Draw truth tables, whatever you have to do to remember these. Let's go to modus tollens. We have if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. Again, if I'm singing in the rain, then I'm happy. I'm not happy, therefore I'm not singing in the rain. Sounds good, right? Let's try another one. If, the, uh, if it rains and the roads are wet, the roads are not wet, therefore it's not raining. Okay, sounds good, right? So uh, that's one way to learn these, okay? But all of these are valid. Again, draw a truth table if you don't believe me. Let's look at the hypothetical syllogism number three. We have if P then Q, if Q then R, and if P then R is the conclusion, the last part. So um, if it's raining, the roads will be wet, right? If it's raining, the roads are wet. So we have P and Q. If P then Q, I'm sorry. And then if the roads are wet, then there will be car accidents. Right? So Q is if the roads are wet, and R is there will be car accidents. So then we can draw the conclusion that if it's raining, then there will be car accidents. Now to help you get the hypothetical syllogism, you might want to think of it like this. P is 1, Q is 2, and R is 3. So if 1, then 2 is the first premise. The second premise is if 2, then 3. And the conclusion, therefore, is if 1, then 3. Okay, it might remind you of some basic math there. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like a slippery slope. P will lead to Q, which will lead to R. So P will lead to R. But remember, not all slippery slopes are fallacious. This is a valid argument. If we put in true statements, then it's a sound one. Okay. So that's the hypothetical syllogism. Draw a truth table if you need to, and memorize it. <laughs> okay. Again, you'll you, even if you don't memorize it now, you'll it'll become part of your memory as we do proofs. Okay. Now to the disjunctive syllogism, we have P or Q, not P, therefore Q. It's always valid. There's absolutes in logic. This is one. Okay. It's always valid. Okay. So I'm either in Dallas or Austin. I'm not in. Well, that's a bad example. Let me say I'm um, either happy or sad. I'm not happy, therefore I'm sad. Okay. Now sometimes you might get confused here with the wedge. Remember both disjuncts can be true. Okay, and We'll go over that later. Review the wedge truth table. In logic we use the inclusive or. Okay. Um, we'll talk about that later. The next one is the constructive dilemma. 
And so we have if P then Q and if R then S. So if I'm singing, then I'm happy. Let's say that's if P then Q. If I'm singing, then I'm happy. And then R is if I'm clogging, then I'm sad. S is sad. If I'm clogging, then I'm sad. Okay. So if I'm singing, then I'm happy. And if I'm clogging, then I'm sad. I'm either singing or clogging. Therefore, I'm either happy or sad. Makes sense. Plug in your own content. Have fun with it. Memorize it. <laughs> okay. Um, look for this one. Whenever you see two uh, conditionals that are joined with the and, and then an or statement, maybe you can use this constructive dilemma. Okay. Number six is very simple. It's just if um, it just says P and Q. Therefore, P. So I'm wearing a blue shirt and I'm wearing clogging shoes. Therefore, I'm wearing a blue shirt. Very simple, right? And um, if you were, let's say you had something like this. If P, then R. And you're trying to get P from P and Q. Well, first you would simplify and get P, and then you could get R, right? Now, if you're a little lost with that, don't worry. We'll do that in the proofs later. 7 is a conjunction, so if we have P, I'm wearing a blue shirt, and then another statement, I'm wearing clogging shoes, we can combine them into one statement. So we can say, therefore, I'm wearing a blue shirt and clogging shoes. Right? So that's conjunction. And then finally, addition is very simple but very useful rule when we're doing proofs. Whenever you have a letter that's in the conclusion but not the premises, you're going to use addition, and, and you'll see that later. But um, So if you just have P, I'm wearing a blue shirt, you can add anything with a OR statement, but not an AND statement, only an OR statement, only the wedge. So I'm wearing a blue shirt or I'm clogging. If P is true, I'm wearing a blue shirt, then P or Q will always be true. If it's true that I'm wearing a blue shirt, then it's true that I'm wearing a blue shirt or I'm clogging. All right? So you can add a little wedge or Q or anything to, to any letter, to any statement that you know is true. Pretty neat, right? <laughs> okay. So those are the rules that are always and absolutely valid. Now let me show you here though some common mistakes um, that you want to avoid. These are invalid rules. Okay? So you want to avoid these. And I want <clears throat> to just uh, not take up the whole screen. Let me just pull this open a little bit. Okay. The first one is affirming the consequent. And we have if P then Q, Q therefore P. This is always invalid. It's a poor imitation of modus ponens if you look carefully. You can affirm the antecedent but not the consequent to get, you know, this conclusion. So affirming the consequent is always and absolutely invalid. If the roads I'm sorry, if it's raining, then the roads are wet. The roads are wet, therefore it's raining. That doesn't follow because it's not saying whenever the roads are wet it's raining. It's saying if it's raining the roads are wet. It's saying if P then Q, not if Q then P. Right? Now you might be a little confused. Substitute in an examples and you'll find an invalid argument somewhere. Okay. Okay. Or just memorize it for now. Draw a truth table too. This one's also always invalid. Okay. Let me move this over so we don't get confused. This is called denying the antecedent. So if P, then Q, not P, therefore not Q. Now, remember with modus tollens, you can deny the consequent, but not the antecedent. Okay. So let's think about this. If it's raining and the roads are wet, it's not raining, therefore the roads aren't wet. Well, the roads could be wet in some other way. Or I'll take another one. If, um, if I'm singing, then I'm happy. I'm not singing, therefore I'm not happy. Well, that doesn't follow, because when I say if I'm singing, then I'm happy, it just means singing makes me happy. It doesn't mean it's the only thing that makes me happy. Singing is a sufficient, not a necessary condition for my happiness, is what premise one says. So we can't infer this not Q. Again, you might be a little lost there. Talk it out, okay, for yourself. Here's another uh, bad invalid argument form that we went over in class. It came up in class, and it took me a couple minutes to give you a counterexample, right? But um, if P, then Q, if P, then T, if Q, then T. That is always invalid. So let me give you an example here. Um, if it's a dog, then it's an animal. That's if P, then Q. Now, if it's a dog, then it's not a cat. That's if P, then T. So if it's an animal, then it's not a cat. So we have a false conclusion and true premises. So we know this is invalid. 
So there is one instance where this is invalid, so the argument form is invalid. Okay. You could also draw a truth table and see it's invalid if you like. Okay. Um, so don't make that mistake. And then finally, here's one other common mistake. P or T. P, therefore not T. Okay, this is invalid too. It's always invalid. If we had not P, we could get T, but we don't have that. If we had not T, we could get uh, um, P, but we don't have that. So the key here is to remember that with the wedge, the only time the wedge is false is when they're both false. Both disjuncts are false. They can both be true. So if I say I'm wearing a blue shirt and cl or clogging shoes, I'm wearing a blue shirt or clogging shoes, and then I say I'm wearing a blue shirt, it doesn't follow that I'm not wearing clogging shoes because remember the wedge says you can be doing both and the wedge will still be true. Okay, So um, the not T just doesn't follow. Know your wedge operator. <laughs> okay, let's pull up um, one other thing. This will prepare you a little bit for the proofs. I did number one already, but if you have if P then Q and not Q, then you can derive not P by combining 1 and 2 in modus tollens. Okay. Now, for the rest of these, you might want to pause it and see if you can figure it out before I go over it. Okay, I'm going to go over them now. Okay, but what you're trying to do is to see what you can derive logically using those rules. So I'm going to pull up the rules too. Where are the rules? Here they are. There we go. So there's the rules, and you should have them in front of you when you're working on this stuff. There's some of the rules. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so if I have S and if S then M, right, what I'm trying to do is use these rules. Oh my goodness, I made a mess there. Use these rules to derive uh, something. Okay, so from these two facts, I can derive M, and that's I'm using one and two, those two premises, those two facts, and I'm using modus. Let's look at the next one. We have n, n, or f, if n, then k. Okay. Sometimes you have three facts and you only need two of them to derive something. Okay. Now, if you're a little lost here, you might just look at the rules. Can I use modus ponens? Well, let's see. Let's start with the first rule. Modus ponens says if p, then q, p, therefore q. And we have n. Oh, and look, we have if n, then k. We can use modus ponens. We just combine 1 and 3, ignore 2. We don't need it. 1 and 3 modus ponens, and we get k. Okay. All right, let's do the next one. And it says if h, then d, if f, then t, if f, then h. Oh my gosh, that's intimidating, right? <laughs> okay, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, not once you get the hang of it. Um, so. We have three horseshoes. Maybe one of the rules that have horseshoes is what we'll use. Okay? I don't see I can I can't use modus ponens anywhere, and you can check for yourself or modus tollens, but I can use the hypothetical syllogism. So look at the hypothetical syllogism on your little um, you should have the rules by you somewhere at all times. And we have if f then h and if h then d. So we can infer if f then d. And how did I get that? I use one and three. Um, let's, or you can say 3 and 1, don't worry about the order yet. And um, and then you look over here, right, hypothetical syllogism, just to remind you if you need to look. Okay. There you go. And notice we ignore 2. We're just using the rules and seeing what we can do here with these facts, these premises. And then look at the last one. It looks intimidating. When you see this within parentheses, just think of this like uh, as a letter. Like A it could just be like it, it represents a whole letter, whatever is inside the premises. And then you have not something. Just think of it as a whole letter, like, like maybe A of F, right? Don't be intimidated by all these letters. What's inside the parentheses is like one letter. So we have a possibility for a modus ponens right here. Okay, let me erase this. Okay, and because we have if blah blah blah, then not the case that blah blah blah. And look, we have the antecedent right here, A or C, A or C. I can't do anything with not B or A, I don't think. Okay, because you have to have not B and D. You can't just have not B in order. You know, well, even if I did, it wouldn't help. So as I'm talking it through, I see that I can apply modus ponens and get not the case that B and D. Oh, that's awful. And that's 1 and 4 
modus ponens. Practice. You need to practice.